Well, good evening and welcome to the first show in February. In fact, the only show in February, I think, because we tend to do them once a month. But people have been asking for more, so you never know your luck. It's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. It's great to have you on board and to see you all there. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, talk with me and uh, ask me questions. I've got a bunch of questions to answer tonight. And um, there's no doubt in my mind that we won't have time to get through all of the questions. But anyway, it's really good to have you all on board. And so what I'm going to do is my normal process where I'm just going to cover a few points first so that we can basically have a bit of a context for the discussion. And then I'll come back to the chat and I'll go through the questions and uh, try and cover as many as I can. And we'll see how long we go for. So that's the plan of campaign. So the running order for today. This introduction, which you've already had, so if you blinked, you missed it. The house rules, we'll just cover those briefly. We'll talk about our models, of course. We always do, because it's important you understand how we get to where we get to with our analysis. Some key slides, and then predominantly the questions and answers part of the show. And um, I've already got lots of questions, plus, of course, the ones on the stream tonight. And... Um, this probably will gonna, it's probably going to take an hour and 20, an hour and 30 all up. Um, but it depends. If we run out of questions, then we'll, we'll, we'll shut down a bit early and we'll sign off and have an early night. Just on the house rules, this is really important. Um, please, you must note, this is not financial advice. I'm not qualified to give financial advice. I don't know your individual circumstances. Please do not take it as such. It's my own thoughts based on my own analysis. Um, I also have the benefit of talking with a whole bunch of other people in the industry. Some of those I share on the uh, on the blog, of course, as well. But it is not financial advice, and you need to make your own decisions and get your own separate advice. Please play nice in the chat room. We don't want any racial slurs. We've had a few in past ones, and some people have been banned as a result. I don't want to ban anybody, but it is being actively moderated. And if we see nasty stuff, we will kill it off. So don't try that on. I do appreciate the community. I do appreciate the quality of the comments. So, you know, you don't need to actually uh, move into slur mode. There's plenty of other good discussions to be had. This is, of course, as at the 19th of February, 2019. So if you're watching this five years later, you will know whether we were right or whether we were wrong in our analysis. But for those watching live tonight, the data is literally as at this evening. And if you want to get my attention, specifically if you want to ask me a question in the live chat, do use the Act what the World uh, monocle. The reason for that is there are just so many chats going on on the live stream, I may miss it. And if you don't get my attention the first time, ask the question again if I haven't answered it in a few moments. Um, the way it works is that I go through from the top and work my way down as best able I can. Now, just on our core model briefly, just so that everyone understands, that we get information from our household surveys, that's consumers and also the small and medium enterprise sector, plus that data from the RBA and other public sources, plus private data. All of that goes into our core market model. The core market model is where we do our deep analysis, and that then supports everything we do from our blogs through to our industry reports and client-specific work. And we have 52,000 households in the model at any one time across the whole of Australia. Uh, of course, we are covering New Zealand now. We don't yet have the survey running in New Zealand, but uh, more on that perhaps a little later. Now, there is some segmentation that goes on. And when I say segmentation, what I'm talking about is the slicing and dicing of information, specifically around um, different cuts of the data. So, for example, different types of people, different locations. Um, the segmentation tells us a lot about what's really going on with the market and who's up and who's down. So that's a pretty important part of the model. Now, so quickly to a few slides. So the RBA minutes came out today. It was the longest set of minutes I've ever read. And frankly, they were pretty boring. But there were two points that came. The first is they are recognising that consumption is slowing, slowed to two and a half percent. And they have revised down their GDP numbers. They've revised down their expectations in terms of inflation. Um, but the critical thing to note is that consumption is coming off. Now, that's important because half of consumption um, is from the consumer sector, and that consumption drives the GDP, but half of the GDP number. 
So in other words, what they're saying is that household consumption is a problem. And then they went on to talk about the slower growth in lending. Um, they talked about the Royal Commission and other things that are dampening it. But the comment at the end was quite interesting. Lenders have continued to compete for borrowers of high credit quality by offering new loans at lower interest rates than those offered on existing loans. And that's a really important point. What it means is that those in the back book, those who have already got mortgages, are paying significantly more than new business being written today. And my question is whether that's a very fair state of affairs, but that's what's happening at the moment and the RBA are recognizing it. Okay, uh, next slide is just talking a, bit, a little bit about um, growth. So this is effectively the credit growth from the RBA and credit housing for credit, Credit housing, credit for housing, I'll get there, is growing at 4.7% annualized. So that's still well above inflation and CPI. And for owner-occupied growth, it's 6.5%. For investment loans, it's a lot lower, about 1.1%. And personal credit's going negative. But the other thing that came out today, ANZ made an update today. And they spoke about the customer borrowing capacity. And they're basically saying there's been a 20% their amount reduction in capacity of people to borrow relative to where it was in 2015. And that's to do with changes to HEM, changes to the servicing rate floor, and also income haircuts. And that's important, right? Because one of the things that people keep asking me is, are the banks going to loosen the taps and how much and when? And the short answer is, they are definitely tighter than they were because lending standards are tighter than they were. And there might be some at the margin. ANZ actually said that they might be pursuing uh, more investment loan borrowers um, of the right quality, but we'll see about that. Um, but nevertheless, the world has changed. And in fact, that 20% is pretty conservative. Some banks are lending 40% less than previously. That's a big deal. And that's one of the reasons why the credit impulse is slowing. The credit impulse is the rate of credit growth, and that drives home prices, which is why we think home prices will continue to fall. Household confidence still is, is in the doldrums. We keep reporting this each month, and it's worth noting that pretty much all segments of the population now are actually not feeling as comfortable as they were. Those who are renting, um, short slight uptick thanks to the fact that the rentals are a little bit cheaper than they were, but if you've got a mortgage, then you're confidence level is going down. And even those without a mortgage, the free afferents as they call them, they also are just now at the 100, which is the long-term average. Now that particular segment of the market is one which normally is quite well aligned to the conservative side of politics. So that tells me that the um, core constituency of the conservative side of politics may have an issue with household confidence. Mortgage stress is still rising. I reported this 31.1% of households. That's more than a million households now in mortgage stress. That's on a cash flow basis. Um, it's a big deal. It's getting worse. And we're seeing the outfall of that. House prices continue to fall lower. So this is a quite interesting piece of information. On the right-hand side of the screen there, you've got the CoreLogic Index, which shows the falls from peak in Sydney down now 12.8%, Melbourne 9.3%. Perth, 17.1%, and the, the majors, 87 and Darwin, of course, is even worse. But on the other side of the screen there, on the left-hand side, Liverpool, according to CoreLogic, has now seen median values drop 23.4% from a, a little while ago. Uh, that's a significant drop, and that's what I keep saying to people, that the averaging that um, talks about peak to trough, you know, doesn't take into account individual circumstances and situations. And to give you another example on that, here are some of the more expensive suburbs and how they fall. And this is from an article in The Australian this week. And you'll see that Box Hill in New South Wales has a 41.3% drop in growth. Another New South Wales postcode, Annas Banks, second, and then Red Hill in Victoria and Barragup in Western Australia. And there we're talking about 41, 39, 33, 31 percent, Liberty Grove, New South Wales, 25 percent, and Gumdale up in Queensland, 24.5 percent. Now these are big falls and of course they're in the slightly more affluent end of the market, but it's getting hopefully the message across that there are some remarkably significant falls in home prices at the moment. And I don't think we've seen the end of the falls.
Bank funding is still a problem, not quite as much as it was. The BBSW move from uh, a year ago or thereabouts is up 21.5 basis points, but the banks have not been able to recover all of that yet, so they've all been reporting margin compression other than Westpac um, recently in, in the most recent rounds, and I'm expecting further out-of-cycle price rises for mortgages like I say, what they're doing is discounting very heavily on the front book, but actually discounting heavily on the back book. And just to make the point that the financials index, this is the average across the financial sector in Australia, is still down 8% from 12 months ago. There was a Hain effect. We got a quite a big bounce, of course, about 7% bounce uh, when the final commission report came out. But nevertheless, the financial sector is still down compared with where it was. And that's telling us something about the prospective future flow of income and returns from the finance sector. And just a slide for our New Zealand viewers. We've got a very large number now of New Zealand viewers. It's great to see you all come on board. And thanks to Joe Wilkes for his help in building the footprint in New Zealand. This is actually from Harcourt's Market Watch, which came out on the 13th. And interestingly there, you can see that the average sale price has dropped from November down to January. Significant amount from 638,000 to 556,000 and the number of sales written is also down and so you can see there that the peaks were the light blue. Um, there are some things going on and in, in fact in Auckland prices over the last year have now dropped on average I think about 10% according to Harcourts. Now, just in terms of our scenarios, I always update the scenarios and there's a lot to do and talk about this month because a lot has happened since we ran the scenarios last time. It comes out of the back of our core market model. And of course, it's just a way of experimenting with and, for, and trying to get a handle on what's going on. It's not really a forecast, but it is a sensitivity to all the data we've got and some suggestions as to what may happen and how it may play out. None of these may be right. Things may change. But at least we've got a stake in the ground. And what I try to do by using scenarios is not get caught into a corner that says it's going to be only X. I'm trying to give you some relative weightings and relative feel of the different solutions that we might see. So, for example, we've got our five or six scenarios here. Business as usual, things only get better, not a, yet doomsday, Armageddon and doomsday. Now, I don't have time to go through what's driving all of those, but I will make a separate post in more detail where I explain again the scenarios and why we use these particular ones. But at least you get a bit of a flavor of the range of them. So let's start with business as usual. This is effectively the Reserve Bank's base case based on all the things they're saying. So my ex expectation over the next 24 to 36 months, we're going to see the employment rate, if they're right, sitting at around 5%. It might drop a little bit and then come back. We are going to see mortgage stress continuing to rise. We're going to see the cash rate roughly where it is. Um, we're going to see bank losses rising a little and home prices down 10 to 15 percent. There will be some easing of credit rules. We've already started to see that at the margins. We'll probably see some more of that. But I only rate this at a 1 percent, a 1 percent chance of that happening. So I'm not very confident that the Reserve Bank has really got their finger on the pulse. In my next scenario, I'm now called things that only get better. And here I believe that over this period, the Reserve Bank will cut rates 1.25%. The employment rate will start to rise to about 5.6%. And you can see there that I've called out easing credit rules, but also fiscal stimulus. So I'm expecting either before or after the election or both, we're going to see consistently higher levels of fiscal stimulus as people try to stimulate the economy. That could be given... All sorts of ways. It could be, you know, a cash splash. It could be more incentive for first time buyers or something different. And I give that a 15 percent weighting down from 20 percent last time around. So I'm not very confident that that is where we are going to get to. And of course, in many places, house prices are already down. This is peak to trough falls we're talking about here um, more than 20 percent. The next one, which is what I call not yet doomsday, is when I see the RBA rate now down to 0.75% over the next few months, 24 to 36 months. We see the unemployment rate rising significantly higher. We see the mortgage stress rate up. We see the bank losses up. And we see home prices dropping from peak to trough 20 to 30%, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne. 
maybe a little less in some of the other locations but uh, certainly in the main markets that's the sort of range we're looking at could be worse in fact but that's what we think and in that scenario my modeling still suggests that one bank is likely to require some bailout assistance to be able to actually survive and the probability now has gone up from 47 percent to 56 percent so this is very much my central scenario at the moment this is what i think is most likely to happen but beyond that we could have ireland 2.0 where effectively um there is bail-in and bail-out and QE2 and all those things. Um, we get interest rates down in towards zero. Um, we see the unemployment rate rising quite a lot higher. We see mortgage stress rising consistently higher. The bank losses raise. And in that scenario, home prices are 30 to 45 percent down. And that would be terrible if that would happen. But you know there is a scenario that looks to me as though it could play out. And that's got a 25 percent rating up from 23 percent. And then the last one, whoops, is Iceland 2.0. This is zero and below from an interest rate perspective. Uh, unemployment rate very, very high. Mortgage stress very, very high. Um, bank losses very, very high. And up to 80% home price. Now, this is an absolute nightmare. Um, the thing that I want to stress here is that I think we're going to see Q more QE at some point through the cycle here and i think probably we could see qe in scenario four or scenario five um, in scenario five though there will be qe and potential bank failures and that's why that's the nightmare scenario so that's the iceland scenario where effectively um, they went through the pain they didn't um, allow um, the um, flows of um, uh, of bail-in effectively to um, deal with the banks the banks were never bailed out effectively and as a result of that we have bank failures now that's not my most central scenario my central one is still not yet doomsday but these other two scenarios are still there um like i say 56 percent now not yet doomsday so really my central scenario is still 20 to 30 percent home price falls peak to trough okay so let's go back to the q and a's and we'll look at the chat and see what um what's going on all right i'm going up to have a look and see what the questions are <laughs> okay okay mmt somebody wants to me to talk about mmt i will talk about mmt but i'll leave that for a little bit uh, later because there is no doubt in my mind that mmt is one of those things that's there in the background unfortunately uh, or fortunately, depending on your point of view. Okay, interesting. Sounds out of sync with a video. Now, that's never had that before. Um, I wonder whether other people are getting the same. But um, tell me if you are. I'll try and do something about it. But it's synced up at this end. I can tell you that the sync is working pretty well. Um, so I'm not quite sure why that is. Anyway, let me um, go back to the uh, go back to the story here. Um, tell me if there is a um, delay in the audio now. OK, going down the list. Adrian Orr actually said in an interview, banks, profits are privatised and losses are socialised. Yes, Wendy, I did see that. I thought that was a very interesting comment from the uh, New Zealand Reserve Bank governor. And he actually went on to say that um, the profitability of the banks in Australia in particular are significantly higher than perhaps they should be, uh, which is a pretty interesting comment. And of course, uh, Orr has a plan to lift the amount of capital for New Zealand banks significantly above where the Australian banks under APRA are likely to be. And both of them, both New Zealand and Australia, from a regulatory perspective, are looking at capital as being the predominant lever to essentially deal with bank stresses and strains then the question is is that necessary and sufficient and my own view is cap more capital is good even more capital is better but it probably will not be sufficient to solve the problem but i do think Orr's comment was very interesting and specifically the concern that he has that in a downturn the big banks basically are too big to fail and they get bailed out Okay, Joe's have just made the point, Joe, Joe Wilkes, um, Harcourt's national sales volumes in January were down 9% over last January. 
Auckland sales volumes were down 15% in last January. Thanks, John. Yeah, um, very interesting data there, I think. And it just shows that I think New Zealand is beginning to uh, get the shivers a bit like uh, Australia did some time back. OK, just going down. OK, Glass Steagall in the Senate, uh, uh, Jace. Yeah. OK, let's talk about that. So very interesting moves this last week. And um, Pauline Hanson basically reintroduced the uh, bank separation bill into the Senate. It was originally introduced into the House of Reps last year by um, Bob Keller, but it uh, ran out of time, timed out. But it's now back and it's now been referred to a Senate inquiry for two months or so, specifically looking at bank separation and whether they whether this particular piece of legislation, which is all built around Glass-Steagall, is actually uh, to be explored further and potentially taken forward. So that inquiry is now running. In fact, I got a message today from the people running that inquiry that they're inviting submissions. Submissions have to be made by the 12th of April. And I guess there'll be more information soon, but they've asked me specifically if I will make a submission, which I will because I think it's very important that we have a conversation about the separation of the banks and Glass-Steagall, and particularly separating the risky activities of derivatives and some of the other things that uh, the commercial side of banking does from the meat and potato core banking, you know, deposits and loans and those sorts of things. Um, and you may have seen the post that um, uh, one of the uh, other people on the channel John Dalson, ex-director of ANZ, uh, and I did the other day, where he and I went through some of the discussions around separation and why it's important. And in fact, John and I recorded another show earlier on today, which will go up in a couple of days, making the point that separation and breaking the banks into pieces would actually get around too big to fail question, get around the exposure of derivatives, get potentially around some of the risks relating to bail-in and bail-out, and also release value potentially to the shareholders of the banks as well now, as well as providing better service to customers and lower risk banking and lower cost banking. So there are so many reasons why this type of thinking is important. And the final thing to say here is that when we talk about Glass-Steagall, we're talking about the separation of risky from less risky uh, functions within the banking system. Another way to think about banking separation is the sales process from the advisory process, because we've still got the situation where at the moment people inside the banking system can make recommendations to customers and customers are not clear whether that advice, be it financial advice or a mortgage, is basically tainted or not, because they could be trying to flog their particular product. So this is conflicted advice. So one of the other ways to think about separation is to separate specifically the advice functions from organizations from the sales and marketing functions of organizations. So that's another angle there. So I hope that's helped a bit on Glass-Steagall. I think it's quite important. There will be an opportunity for um, uh, other people to put submissions in and um, I'm going to be recording an episode with um, Robbie Barwick from the CC shortly and we're going to describe there the process by which people can actually put submissions in and we are recommending and encouraging everybody to put submissions in because this is a really important opportunity potentially to get our banking system to work for us rather than against us. OK, let's go down the list. OK, Andrew says, no mention of the declining household savings ratio in the RBA minutes. Surely they should have mentioned this. Yes, Andrew, I agree. Absolutely. It is, for me, one of the critical indicators of concern that we've seen the household savings ratio drop significantly. It's lower now than it's been actually this side of the GFC. And when I look at the data and look at my household servers, the, what it tells me is that it's not that people are really, really confident, so they're running their savings down. What they're doing is they're raiding their savings just to make their finances work. Now, that can only work for a little period of time. And eventually, they end up either um, running out of savings or starting to put more on uh, credit cards or taking other loans. So it is a very, very concerning indicator at a time when interest rates are ultra low in Australia, but the mortgage 
burden in Australia is remarkably high. Okay, Gemma's asked, if banks create money they loan out of thin air, why does it matter when people can't pay back the loan? Ah, yeah, okay. So the whole philosophy of banking ultimately is to generate profits from the margins that they actually charge. But the point about creating money out of thin air is they don't need the money in the bank to lend it out first. What they do is they actually write a paper entry to create a loan if somebody wants a loan. And then subsequently they'll, they'll go and fund it and uh, they'll basically piggyback off the margin that they've developed. Now, of course, margins in Australia are actually still very high on an international basis. And even now, the, the returns, return on equity of our banking system is way higher than many others around the world. And indeed, um, you know, artificially high in my view, because we don't really have real competition in the banking sector. But the short answer is that's how banks make a lot of their money. The other way is they charge fees. And many banks have found it tougher recently to charge fees for various sorts of services. Um, some are, but um, Bank of Queensland, for example, they actually said they had margin trouble and they had fee trouble, which is one of the reasons why their share price dropped a 7% yesterday. Okay, let's go down the list. Can we talk about money creation versus sound money? Could this bubble have occurred in a sound money system? That says Harold. Short answer is no. The thing that's created the problem here is the bank's ability to continue to inflate their balance sheets by writing ever more loans. As I said, what they do is they basically write a loan out of thin air and then subsequently go and fund it um, from the international capital markets specifically or from deposits or some other sources, but uh, you know, still 30% plus from the international capital markets. Now, they've had no limit to how much they can grow their balance sheets, providing that they hold that little bit of capital that's required under BAL, but that doesn't really cost them very much. Um, and what that means is that they've been able to drive huge growth into their balance sheets. That actually has inflated home prices. As home prices inflate, they're able to actually make even bigger mortgages because the loan to value ratio moves in the right direction. Those bigger mortgages effectively then mean that they can actually write more loans. More loans inflates their balance sheet and it goes on ad infinitum. That's the credit loop. Now, if the amount of money in the system, the amount of credit in the system, was actually anchored to something solid like gold or something else, then that process would not be allowed to happen because effectively it would be anchored. In fact, some people in the, around the world are arguing the only way to solve the banking crisis is to stop the banks effectively creating that leverage loop. So in other words, they could lend up to the amount of deposits they hold, but no more. And essentially they will be crimped by their ability to do that. So none of this magic out, out of thin air. So it would have changed the system. And here's the point that people perhaps don't sometimes get. By inflating mortgages and lifting the amount of repayments that people have to make even with interest rates very low it takes all of the air out of the broader economy it means that households have less to spend on other things and it therefore has a negative impact on the broader economic outcome and a significantly adverse impact on the welfare of most households so these massive home prices are not free money these, have, these massive home prices are not creating real value for people. They're just inflating it artificially. And so whilst it's painful, it is also true that long term we need to get back to a level of ratio between income and home prices and income and mortgages that actually is more sustainable. So typically we found that in Sydney and Melbourne up to quite recently, people were getting loans up to 10 times their income. Just remarkable. In the good old days of lending, when I was in the bank, it was three times or three and a half times. Now, we need to get back to that. And in fact, some of the lenders have now said, well, anything more than five times, we're not probably going to look at. So they've already pulled some of it back. But this is a really big deal. But the real fundamental point is, unless we can break that nexus between ever more lending, we're going to see essentially the 
thing continue the same way. And then if you overlay quantitative easing, so if quantitative easing were to be brought in, which basically just means putting more money in the system, so basically it devalues the real value of every dollar, it just inflates the value of everything, it makes the mortgages even bigger, but it doesn't solve anything. And of course, the QE from a decade ago that the Reserve back that the um, Fed is dealing with in uh, in the U.S. or indeed they're dealing with in Europe, it's still troublesome. And in fact, both in Europe and in the U.S., there is now talk of more QE ahead potentially. So we haven't actually got ourselves out of this loop, and that's a big deal. Okay. Now, uh, Genevieve's talking about um, Steve Keen and his Jubilee. Let me just talk about that. Yeah, so what we get to the point eventually where effectively the debt becomes unmanageable. And I think we're close to that now. 31% of households in mortgage stress, from a cash flow perspective, they're pretty much unable to deal with those repayments. So the question is, what do you do about that? Do you just let it go on ad infinitum? There's a point at which we're debted out and therefore it can't go on growing. Um, we're starting now to tighten lending standards. And that means that people have got mortgages today that they wouldn't have got, th uh, that, sorry, people have got mortgages today they got three or four years ago that they wouldn't have got today. And the question then is, what do you do about that? Do you hope that magically income is going to start rising and therefore people are going to be able to continue to pay these massive mortgages for the next 25 years and finally escape? Or do you move to some sort of reset process? And that reset process could be a revaluation of the of the loan and the property. It could be a debt, du a debt jubilee, which is what Steve Keen talks about, which basically is a forgiving of loans or a resetting of loans. Or well, there are other mechanisms that people would talk about. Now, of course, then people talk about moral hazard, which basically says, well, why would I, who didn't make such a big uh, a loan and uh, you know don't have the same issues, why do I not have the chance to escape when these people are given a chance to escape? And that's one of those uh, questions and of course the other side of the equation is what happens to banks and their balance sheets and their shareholders so it's a big complicated process but my own view is we've got to the point in Australia where we've got so much debt that the normal mechanisms and approaches for managing debt going forward are not going to work so we need some new thinking and maybe even the debt jubilees is part of the answer um, more to say I think on that in the next few months <laughs> yes, John Adams. Hello, John. The cook called Martin North incompetent. Yes. Now, interesting question, isn't it? I wonder why he thinks I'm incompetent. Well, I don't know quite because I'm just using data. And if you look at what I said last year in terms of what's happened to home prices, I've been pretty spot on, I'm afraid. He hasn't. But he then keeps resetting his position. So I'm not really sure who's competent and who's incompetent. I'll just leave it there and carry on. OK, what else have I got? This is from Cold Fusion. Hi, Martin. In your view, do you think Australia will have a banking crisis after the housing bubble pops? Well, generally what happens if you look at, and I've studied a whole bunch of uh, housing crises and financial crises. It's the housing sector that goes first and around 18 months later it then spreads into the broader economy and that then hits the banks and we end up with a banking crisis and a liquidity crisis. That's what happened in the GFC and that's what happened in pretty much every crisis that I've looked at over the last 200 years or so. So unfortunately there's a very high probability that the housing crisis and particularly the fall in values will flow through into a banking crisis. And bear in mind this, house prices, as I showed you earlier on, have dropped significantly. You know, in some places they're 41% down. The banks have not been rewriting the values in their books. They're still actually using the values that they were wrote on the day one when the loan was actually taken out. If they did mark those loans to market now and that value of property to market now, in many cases, people will be in negative equity and therefore the risk profile of those loans will be a lot higher and as a result of the bank, the bank would need to hold much more capital. First point. Second point is liquidity. So because the banks are needing to fund internationally all the time, there's a question of confidence. And frankly, one of the reasons why the BBSW rate is higher than it was is because there's less confidence, internationally speaking, 
compared with where it was. Because people internationally are a little bit concerned about the way the banks have been and they've been paved and what was revealed in the Royal Commission, all of those things. And so there is certainly a risk that liquidity freezes. And if liquidity freezes, we get a banking crisis. The third thing to understand is that if there is an international crisis and that impacts the derivative sector, which is a massive 760 trillion or something, I think was the number I saw last, um, massive size of an issue. Our banks in Australia are actually in the derivatives markets and they could be exposed to extremely large losses. Now, those losses would then flow over into, their, into the rest of their banking because they're consolidated entities. So effectively, the risk-taking derivative stuff is not disconnected from the other core banking stuff. So in other words, it is feasible that deposits could be bailed in to answer the call from derivatives. And that, to my mind, is problematic. One of the reasons why I believe that we should be thinking about banking separation. So I'm afraid that a banking crisis is certainly quite conceivable down the track. And DB said, shouldn't the banks be marking to market soon? They should, but they won't. Um, so basically, one of the reasons why a lot of the bank's economists are still calling a very narrow, small fall in home prices, despite all the evidence, is because if they actually started calling larger falls, then effectively they would get to the point where they would need to re-rate. And if they did, um, what that means is that the uh, losses could be quite significant. Now, if you look carefully, the people who've actually been calling the falls the greatest, like, for example, Shane Oliver's AMP, a 25% fall, peak to trough, or UBS, don't have retail banking to the same extent. So I think they're more free to call it as is. And there are other people who even now are saying 30 to 35%. I'm not the only one. So more people are saying more falls, but I do think there is a marked market question. And uh, so far, as I understand it, none of the banks have actually taken that step. Okay, <laughs> he says 30 to 40% doesn't seem that wild. Now, no, it doesn't, unfortunately. Remember when I first basically propagated that, uh, you know, that thought um, last August? I guess 60 Minutes was one of the first times it went public. You know, there was a huge amount of... Um, of howls and everybody said it's impossible it's never going to be like that um, but actually it proved to be quite like that um, I just did another 60 minutes thing a couple of weeks ago because we covered the um, uh, Opal Tower thing as well and I've had nobody actually come to me and say it's not likely now so there's a much greater acceptance of these sorts of faults which I think is quite a significant change okay so Moet says, should we buy financial shares after the big crash? Well, I'm not going to give you financial advice, but what I can say is that if you were to have bought shares in, for example, some of the banks in the UK after the GFC, when they'd actually hit their all-time lows, you would have made a reasonable return since. Um, the Royal Bank of Scotland is still 68%, I think, owned by the state in the UK because that's bailed out by the, by the UK government. But their share prices are doing a little better. And in fact, they reported recently a doubling of profit compared with the previous year. So there's a little bit of uh, light there. But the um, thing about shares, of course, is they can go up and they can go down. So you never know. And I think the final point to make on this is there's a question as to whether the banking systems, banking structures that we've got are really sustainable. So there's been for a generation, effectively, a privatization of the financial system, a financialization of, if you like, the economy and indeed households. So in other words, more and more of what we're doing is linked to finance and linked to debts and those sorts of things. My own view is that's not going to work forever. We need an alternative future path. And I think that includes right-sizing the banks. One of the reasons why I think Glass-Steagall is important. Reducing their reliance on international funding and restricting their ability to lend so that effectively we can get back to a more sustainable banking sector. Here's the thing. We need an economy in Australia that is not just based on the banking sector. And remember that a large proportion of dividends 
are from the finance sector, nearly half, I think, last time I looked. That's a really crazy number. And so my argument is we need to find alternative growth engines compared with the financialization of things. And that's probably true in other countries too. But then, of course, you've got very large international banks who are exerting their authorities and taking positions and basically working outside um, some of the uh, you know, existing relationships and, frankly, are so powerful. And bear in mind, of course, too, that quite a few of these uh, bankers end up going into the regulatory environments inside um, uh, each of the countries, inside the central banks, inside the, uh, you know, the likes of APRA around the world. And so there's a bit of a revolving door between bankers and regulators and regulators and bankers. And one of the reasons why the Royal Commission findings were so interesting was they highlighted that effectively the regulators were totally ineffective because they were on the same side of the street. They weren't actually looking after the interests of consumers. So I'm looking for a new banking model, a different banking model, not just a replication of the current ones. And probably bank shares will then go through a bit of a spin dryer if that would be the case. One reason why it may not happen anytime soon, but maybe it'll happen at some point. Now, there's a couple of interesting points there. Somebody said uh, the banks are buying their own shares. Yeah, there have been some share buy buybacks, absolutely, particularly over in the US, and they've been using uh, cheap debt to do it. So that's one of the reasons why share prices are actually up quite a bit. Um, some are less so, of course. Okay. Um, notice banks are reducing bank branches. Are they deleveraging? No, it's not really deleveraging. I mean, bank branches are quite expensive, but the fact is that transactions through the branches are dropping considerably, and they're actually using more digital channels, and more transactions are being digitized. Now, whether in fact you think digitalization of cash is a good thing or not is a whole new ball game. Remember that once cash is digitized, it can be much more controlled. It can be turned on and off. Uh, we've got the MPP, which is the next generation payment platform, which effectively will be where a lot of this could be happening. And of course, the Reserve Bank has a finger in that pie. Um, but the fact of the matter is that branches are becoming less important. More people are actually doing th more things online or using mortgage brokers and people like that. Um, and the costs of running a branch are pretty expensive. And there's also a last person standing problem. So if you're in a small town, you don't want to be the last person standing because then you've got difficulty in exiting because of the social obligation that that represents. So a lot of people are quitting while they're ahead. And the number of bank branches will continue to fall, in my view. And also look at the number of ATMs. They're also down considerably, too. OK, um, Victor said, according to realestate.com, Turak is down over 35 percent. Yes. And if you look there carefully, you'll notice that quite a lot of the apartments, particularly some of the new flash ones, have dropped significantly. And that takes me to a broader point about apartment pricing. So some of the new apartments over the last couple of years, particularly those with perhaps some uh, questionable construction techniques, are down 15 to 18 percent in some cases now, according to the valuers that I've been talking with, even before you start. Uh, let alone the fact that there may be lots of people now trying to sell off the plan before they actually have to complete because they can't get the cash anymore. So it's a big deal. OK, um, question here. What's the current mortgage rate default rate in Australia? Um, what rate would cause an economic collapse? Yeah, so 90-day default rates are well under 1% at the moment, although it's rising just a little. It's been rising consistently over the last few months, but it's still very low on an absolute basis. Um, but if you look, there has been firstly a nearly doubling of that over in Western Australia. So it can be up nearly to 2% over in Western Australia. And they've had longer term issues. House prices have gone sideways for five, six, seven years. Cost of living uh, are not being covered by any wages increase. Uh, rentals are down 20% plus. So Western Australia, to my mind, is a uh, harbinger of what we could see more broadly. So as a result of that, um, the default rates were a lot higher there. But more recently, we're starting to see default rates rise in Western Sydney and also in some areas of Melbourne. And that's where we've seen very significant growth in mortgage stress. Now, mortgage stress takes about 18 months to 24 months to work through into defaults. So my expectation is we will continue to see mortgage defaults rise, especially if interest rates to end borrowers do up a little, as I hinted they might going forward. And we've got the fundamental issue that incomes are not growing, costs of living are growing, people are debted up, and they will struggle for a period of time, but eventually will get to the point where they have to do something. 
And the other thing to say is there's a hardship thing going on in Australia as well. The banks are required to help. And in many cases, the banks will start to encourage people to sell, to release the equity that they've got, to be able to escape um, before effectively they lose it all. So I'm seeing quite a few sales being brought forward by the banks now when they actually um, are trying to help. So they, they might forgive interest for a little while, but often it comes to a, a sell. Now, of course, there's no real record of people in that situation who end up in a conversation with the bank, ultimately selling, getting out with their shirt. But I think it's quite a significant factor. OK, let me see what else I've got here. <laughs> John Adams says the RBA has no idea. Well, looking at the minutes today, John, I have to say, I read through them and thought, your data and our data, it's not the same. I'm seeing it quite differently, as we did a post the other day, didn't we, on that very thing. Um, I really feel that the RBA is out of ammo. OK, let's go down the list. OK, just a quick question. This is from from Jean. Just a quick question. And maybe it's something that is has nothing to do with real estate property. But we as when consumers, we struggle to get a decent and secure and stable renting property. Yeah. Now, that's very interesting, um, Jean. One of the things that I've noticed is that in some places, um, the investors are trying to ratchet up rentals and effectively trying to push people out so that they can actually um, uh, ask for a higher amount. Now, in some states, there is now a change in the regulatory environment, which means that they are less able to do that. Victoria is a good example of that. In other states, it's less of a less of an issue. But in some cases now, people are actually rent. People who are renting are switching more frequently from place to place to place because their rents are actually still going up. In Sydney, they are down about three percent, but in other places, they're still going up. So you're right there. The second point is that renters are also often in a degree of financial stress. About 60% of people who are renting show in rental stress. And so very often they are forced to switch to a cheaper place because they can't afford to pay the rent on the one they've got. And we're seeing a lot of that at the moment in Western Sydney. We're seeing a lot up in Queensland. And we're seeing it also in some areas in Victoria. So I think this is another factor that is not fully understood. So the rental sector is a real big deal. I think I'd also add that about half of all people who are investors with a rental property are underwater from a cash flow perspective now, and it's getting significantly worse. I did a post on that the other day. OK, Shannon's asked, can you tell me what would happen when a bank deposits Another capital is less than its fractional limits. Well, yes. So basically, banks are required to hold uh, a certain set of ratios, right? And basically, they are required to maintain those ratios. Now, if they're getting close, the first thing that they can do is to convert some of the bonds that are convertible bonds into shares to be able to actually uplift the capital, right? So that's why a lot of banks have been writing these convertible bonds with offering very high coupons to essentially attract potential investors. But the thing to understand is they are potentially convertible. The second thing to say is that if in fact uh, things get uh, pretty bad, there is of course the bail-in legislation. Now that came in a year ago and of course it predominantly firstly focuses on these convertible bonds which we've spoken about. But there is a debate in Australia as to whether it also includes deposits. And in some countries, like in New Zealand, it's absolutely clear, deposits can be bailed in and converted to equity to save a bank, stop it falling over. And so deposits in some circumstances could be grabbed. And by the way, a deposit in this world is defined as an unsecured loan that you are making to the bank. So that's, that's the reason. So that unsecured loan is effectively converted to equity. And what happens to it? Whether the bank succeeds. If the bank succeeds in surviving, you might get some of your deposit back later. You might not. Or you might be a shareholder in lieu of deposits. So it is a big deal. Um, the Baal rules basically says banks need to hold these 
ratios. If they are unable to hold those ratios, regulators then have powers to intervene, stop them lending, impose penalties on them, um, potentially get them to raise more capital, or ultimately um, manage a bank through what's called a living will, which basically is slicing it and dicing it and breaking it up and passing it on for somebody else. And of course, quite a few banks post the GFC were picked up by other uh, banks and effectively just disappeared. So that's the other thing that's part of the structure. But my point from earlier on was this, just using capital to try and control the risks in the banking sector is very, very myopic and probably will not be successful in dealing with all the risks that we see. OK, going down the list. Andrew says, unemployment is the elephant in the room. Yeah, I tend to agree with you on that. Um, unemployment is very low at the moment, officially, 5%, right? But if you look at the real numbers, and remember that that's basically on an hour of um, employment a, um, a month, I think. Um, what it means is a lot of people are in limited employment because underemployment, that's in other words, the difference between the capacity to work and work they've got is very high. It's about 9%. And so we've got a lot of people who are in work, but not really in work. And we've got a lot of people who are working multiple part-time jobs, for example, you know, being an Uber driver or selling as well, to try and make ends meet and not making ends meet. And what's interesting about my mortgage stress data is a lot of people are registering that their income is just purely insufficient despite the fact they have multiple jobs and their real status of employment is nowhere near what the statistics, the normal statistics actually reveal. Now, that's a big deal. Uh, we are following the rules that have been laid around, down around the world in terms of how to define employment, but it's rather convenient because it understates the problem. Just as CPI understates CPI, cost of living, real cost of living for most people is significantly higher than the CPI number, and yet the Reserve Bank makes decisions based on CPI, not real cost of living. Another nuts thing. So I'm afraid that some of these um, statistical sets are really quite deceiving. And don't give us the true picture. <laughs> okay. You know, it says, should I quit my job now? I don't know what your job is. Um, no, probably not. Jobs are good. Uh, more jobs, probably better. I don't really think I can answer that. Okay. Now, how are we doing? We're nearly at nine o'clock. I think I've pretty much caught up with the questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go across to the um, Q&A that I actually had earlier on and just talk to some of those. And then I'll come back and pick up the live chat once again. OK, now this was quite interesting. Uh, Maria asked, we're reading and watching all the content. Um, most of your content in Australia is based on either Melbourne and Sydney. Can you give us an idea of the situation in Canberra? Um, there's a bit of a debate about it. Is the state unique? Um, is it linked to the different demographics or is it at risk because of the government employees? And yeah, Canberra has been called quite recently pretty buoyant, although I have noticed that unit prices are beginning to slide in a number of postcodes in Canberra. You've got a very cons considerable amount of new development going on at the moment in Canberra. And my own view is that there is definitely now the first signs of the market beginning to turn. So it's definitely got more life, not least because income in the public sector is a little higher. The growth of income is a little higher and that's helped a little bit. And of course, the cost of property in Canberra are not as high as perhaps in some other places, although it's grown up, grown up quite a lot. So I think you're in a state of transition. Um, what, I'm, what I'm going to do is I will make a separate post and go through Canberra in more detail because I think there's a big story to tell here. And I may get John Adams to help me because I know he's just been involved in a transaction in Canberra and he may have some first-hand experience to... Uh, to relay to. But I take your point, Canberra is, we should definitely talk about it. Okay. This is from Tom. I'm a New Zealander. 
and he values the work. Joe, thank you very much. Interesting to note the fall back in property prices following the ban on foreign buyers and tighter AML requirements. Any chance you consider doing a similar prediction matrix for the New Zealand markets as you've done for Australia? Very interesting question there, Tom. Um, I use the household survey data in Australia to drive a lot of the analysis that I do in my scenarios. Now, I don't have that same data in New Zealand, and I don't think at the moment there's any way of sourcing household level information of similar type in New Zealand. So I've either got to build a different scenario model, which takes the available data rather than the household data, and I could do that, or I've got to find a way of getting survey data embedded in New Zealand. So it's not something I can promise to do in the short term, but it's something that I will keep in the back of my mind because, as I said earlier on, we've got a very good audience now from New Zealand. Very pleased to see that. And um, my view is that um, there is definitely an opportunity to, um, uh, you know, go further into the New Zealand end of things. Joe is going to help me on this as well. He's going to visit some more places and provide some more data. And we're going to try and relay more of the information in New Zealand. And if I can find a way of getting household data, then we'll build some scenarios for you. Okay, next one, Hugh. If you encounter a big problem in the near future while China is leading the charge back to QE with the rest of the world, who's going to be in the front runner to get Australia for pennies on the dollar? Yeah, so this is a very interesting question because it touches on one of those international risks. So. A lot of my modelling is based on looking at what's happening locally. So the 20 to 30 percent fall is basically a set of local risks. But you've got to overlay slowing growth in China. We know that, for example, in China, they've uh, throttled back the capital that banks have to hold. And China's now actually put further restrictions on the international export of cash so that people find it harder to bring money out to buy internationally because they're trying to protect their uh, local. I mean, they've got a huge number of properties built in China that have nobody living in them. I did a post on that the other day. And there are other signs of um, risks in China and slow momentum in China. So China, to me, is a significant risk. And frankly, if the trade talks do not go well with the US, we could see a lot more of that. Then, of course, you've got to think also of Europe, and there are some risks there as well. Growth is being forecast much lower in Europe. We've got Brexit to worry about. That could definitely be a trigger point. And then, of course, you've got the US and some of the issues there. Now, of course, the Fed has basically stepped away from lifting rates any further. They're talking about doing QE down the track. So there's a big change in the wind, and that's one of the reasons why funding costs in the US are a little down. But those risks are somewhat there too. And the other thing I'd say just on risks, if, in fact, China and the US do reach a trade agreement of some sort, it could well be that we see the stock market really race up and that could be quite a significant peak, but I suspect that's the peak before the fall because that could well be the trigger for the next big downward cycle, which I still believe is there. But as I said later, I've said before, and we'll say again, later in the year probably or early next year. 2019 is the critical year when all this plays out. But I do expect stock markets around the world, and particularly in the US, to run higher if in fact the trade talks are successful. OK, one other question will go here. Whoops. OK, Adam said, even with your estimates of a 30 percent price fall, this would leave Sydney's housing still severely unaffordable. Why can't house prices fall to the traditional level of three to four times household incomes? Yeah, good question. The answer is that the lending standards are still weaker than that. So they're allowing five times on average. So that still gives some capacity. And also, of course, Got to think about the implications. If home prices do slide down and they slide down quickly, um, ultimately that could be good, but the journey is very painful. And, and, you know, people are worried about the rate of fall and the fact that they could have feedback loops in terms of negative wealth, in terms of lack of uh, um, confidence in the economy and uh, all of those things. So the problem is it's very hard to unpick this inflated house pricing that we've done and that's why so often it ends up with the banks just preferring to QE again and just keeping the bubble even bigger and kicking the can down the road because tackling the fundamental issues would be very, very painful and would considerably reduce our banking sector, considerably reduce the assets of many people, 
psychologically a lot of people will feel a lot poorer the government will get blamed for it a bunch of reasons why it's tough to see okay let me go back to the um let's see what we've got here okay i saw some other questions let me just go back a bit what's holding prices up in places like newcastle and wollongong says the stranger yeah good question essentially places like newcastle and wollongong have not gone up as high there's a few units a lot of units being built i'm seeing about a six percent fall forecast over the next 12 months in those two places i'm expecting those falls though will continue as we go forward it's just that they didn't rise as fast as uh, elsewhere and they will tend to follow the main centers um so david asked about the um dying of money and specifically talking about inflation um think all terminal inflation so the argument is there's a point at which inflation can't go on going up and essentially could uh, begin to ease away again are we in that state short answer is don't know but it's a good question i'll do some more analysis on that and perhaps come back to you as a separate post i'm dying asked about mmt yeah mmt is a, one of those things that of course is an alternative strategy that people have actually um, talked about rather than actually trying to deal with debt what you do is you let your debt run because actually employment becomes more important and if the debt's bigger the economy can still work no problem is basically the argument i'm not sure i'm convinced by it but there are a lot of people in government and advising to government who believe that mmt is an alternative and of course in the us people like bernie sanders are actually quite influenced by the mmt school of thought so it is a quite worrying trend and i personally think that the questions that need to be asked about MMT are quite different. People are also very passionate about it, so they are either very positive or very negative on MMT. In fact, John and I did a show on this some time ago. I'll put a, a link in the comments below. Okay. Um, somebody's asked about Bo Box Hill. Box Hill. Um, I mentioned Box Hill earlier on, I think. So I'm not going to talk about Box Hill again. Um, okay. Paul said I was at the Perth Mint and they said that at the bank you're an unsecured creditor if you take your if you take something to the bank for safekeeping you're an unsecured creditor um the birth the perth mint stores it for free um so the question is is that true if you put something in safe deposit box in a bank my understanding is that um it is not as an unsecured creditor because they don't know what's in the box uh, generally it is simply that they are in looking after it for safekeeping but look at the small terms and conditions or the long terms and conditions because i could be wrong on that but when i was in the bank um, a safe deposit box had no knowledge of what was in the box so you could not be an unsecured creditor um, okay and then darius asked about the correlation between money supply and inflation and yeah You've asked a very complicated question there, Darius, which I'm not going to be able to answer it tonight, other than to say that as money supply continues to um, expand because people just write more of it, of course, the true value of things deflates, so the real value of money goes down, but the counter goes up, right? So you've got a bigger value house, but it's not really bigger value. And that's really the problem, because effectively what happens is that you get inflation, inflation drives um, higher as you you know just make things larger but it's not real it's an illusionary increase in value and that's why we need to anchor back something more substantial ultimately in my view and if we did that we don't necessarily have to see inflation working the same way okay okay harold has said other world's cities are also experiencing property deflation london vancouver toronto yeah absolutely almost everybody is and i think that's significant um, my own view is that uh, we are going to see a considerable uh, and probably quite matched fall in a number of places. And it's because we've all reached this same situation where debt's too high, it's hard to service, um, lending standards are being tightened. Although in the UK, I noticed that um, they've just loosened standards having tightened them five years ago. And that's make a point. So some people asked me earlier on, one or two people asked me, are the banks going to loosen the, the credit tap a little bit but not very much not enough to make a huge difference so my expectation is that the supply of credit will continue to go down 
and that will be a big deal in terms of actually uh, seeing home prices fall. Remember, credit impulse drives home prices. The rate of credit growth lifts prices as credit impulse slides, so home prices fall. That's a fundamental modelling point that I basically come to. Um, OK, now, any other questions? Let's have a look. Yes, somebody said quantitative easing, the social benefits for the rich. I think that's a really important point because what we are actually seeing is the strategies that we are seeing around the world and the QE thing supports the banking system and supports the investors in the banks and it supports the 1%. But actually, the bulk of the population are precisely those who are being hit by all of these, that you know, real incomes aren't growing, that the costs of finding somewhere to live continues to rise. And unfortunately, it's the majority who end up carrying the can for the minority. And unfortunately, the central bankers and even the government are over fixated on the 1%. And that for me is the, I feel like the underlying issue here. Right? And that's why I talk about a different banking structure. We need a different way of thinking about banking. Um, it's going to be a big deal, um, but it's not going to come easy. It's not going to become quick, which is why we need to focus on things like separation of the banking functions and those sorts of things as a way of beginning to move towards that alternative model. I think the current way that we've thought about banking for a generation, which is privatise the banks, let them charge like a wounding bull, never mind customers, that all came out in the Royal Commission, has shown to be out of steam. We need a customer-centric approach to banking. We need one that actually is focusing on the real economy, not just the financialization of the banking system and growing the banking system ever bigger to be able to create more returns for the investors in the banks. We need real economy being supported, and that's not happening at the moment. OK, Mark says, are we at the start of a synchronised global housing downturn? Um, yeah, probably, because gr global growth is going down. Um, we're seeing significant falls in some places in the States now, in the UK, uh, and other places too. So it certainly could be. Um, similar set of things. Canada is following quite closely the model now that Australia is following. So we're seeing falls there as well. And remember this. Falls in house prices tend to gather steam and gather momentum. And the more that they fall, the harder it is to stop them falling. And in my analysis of many different falls of housing over the years, I have never seen a little adjustment that then just bounces back and everything is marvellous. Once the momentum gets to a certain point, you have to go through the whole way. And I think we've already passed that point, which is why my 20 to 30 percent uh, analysis is still right. OK, well, I think I'm pretty much done. Um, so. I did the uh, ending a bit quick just because I wasn't sure whether I was going to be able to keep the camera going. And I should explain the camera also has the microphone. So when the camera goes off, the mic goes off as well. <laughs> as well. I may change that for next time just in case. So um, let me just have a quick back over in case I've missed anything. OK. Let's have a look. Ah, uh, somebody's made the point. S mirroring Japan. Yeah, we could be, actually. Long, slow slide, 10 years plus, very low levels of growth, very low levels of um, asset appreciation, um, very low levels of interest rates. Um, all of those sort of factors could well be the way it plays out. We do have the resource sector, of course, which helps. And we are getting um, some seagull benefits from the exchange rates at the moment. And of course, if China keeps buying resources, that, that does support us a little bit. But nevertheless, my view is it's quite worrying because this is not a short, sharp <coughs> correction. This is a con consistent slide. And as I said, the Reserve Bank really is not fully reflecting, I think, the risks that I see in the economy. And I think there are significantly more risks ahead and unfortunately, we don't have a plan B as to where growth is going to come from. Neither do we have a sustainable path to a more sort of stable economy, because in fact, maybe growth is actually unsustainable now, simply because there is a point beyond which it's impossible to maintain growth. And I think we've probably come quite close to that. OK. OK, so there's just... 
<laughs> okay, just seeing whether there's anything else. No, I think we're pretty much there. Um, okay, so if anybody has a last question, ask me now. Otherwise, I'm going to pull the pin and uh, sign off for tonight. Um, so I want to say thank you very much for um, spending time with me. It's been a pleasure spending uh, an hour plus with you and uh, taking um, your questions. Please, if you like what you've seen here today, share it, like it. Um, I really need you to spread the word about DFA. So through your social media channels, um, you know, through your blogs, however you communicate, please tell people about DFA because we need to get the word out there, right? We're actually being quite successful in helping to shake things up. So for example, later this week, um, RBA governor is going to go before um, the um, uh, government uh, uh, committee, economic committee. Um, they can have could be asked questions about gold, for example, thanks to John Adams and his gold. Um, the input that we're going to make to the structural separation debate, I think is also important too. So we have an important role to play here to try and help get banking and the finance system working more effectively, but also to help individuals understand what's going on and to make better decisions. We can't make decisions for you, but we can provide you with information to be able to make better decisions. And that's what DFA is about. It's about information. It's about sharing. It's about perspective. But ultimately, it's not going to be telling you about what to do, because effectively, that's something that you're going to have to figure out for yourself. But at least we can provide an objective, independent view of the data that's out there. And as the data changes, we'll share that if things get better. If in, if in fact, we get uh, positive news, we'll share that too. Okay, so just a few things to say before I close. Um, firstly, uh, please, you can support our work via Patreon. Um, very grateful for those who are. It's really important. It helps us to do the things we can do. Um, or via PayPal. A few people are doing that. Thank you very much for your contributions. You know, this makes a huge difference to us in terms of our ability to be able to manage um, our shows. A um, lot more content on the DFA blog. And um, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, good stuff there. Have a look over there. If you've not signed up, you can get all the alerts that we do. And a few shows. Should I buy now? Or should I sell now? Some lines in the sand from Property Imperative. Joe Wilkes from New Zealand. Um, Ed Edwin talking about the dead canary in the coal mine. And Australia does not have his superpowers. Now, that's on the Interest of the People website as well with John Adams, which is our new site. So thank you very much for watching. Have a great evening. And uh, thank you very much for watching Digital Finance Analytics and participating. And I'll see you next time. We'll do this next month. And uh, take care for now. And hopefully the end credits will run when I press this here button. Thank you.